Welcome to the Science Behind. This video is part of the Science Behind Blacksmithing series. Today we are going to talk about the physics and chemistry behind forging metal. Here we have some iron forged leaves. This is just the kind of project that an apprentice blacksmith would have to complete day after day to develop the skills that a blacksmith needs. But what kind of physical and chemical changes have to occur that allow a blacksmith to change a rod of iron into the shape of a leaf? Everything is made up of atoms. They are so small you can't see them even with the best microscope and they are made up of even smaller particles. Protons and neutrons are contained in the atom's nucleus. These two particles are large enough to have a mass. Electrons, on the other hand, are so tiny that they do not have a mass. They orbit around the nucleus moving incredibly fast. If we add energy to an atom, the electrons change how they orbit. If we add enough energy, or heat, we can cause electrons to move from one atom to nearby atoms. Stable atoms have the same number of protons as electrons, but the number of neutrons can vary, and atoms with a specific number of protons and electrons are called elements. Here we have a periodic table of elements. The elements in the table are arranged by their atomic number, which is the number of protons in their nucleus. Each row of elements are called a period, and each column is a group. The element iron with the chemical symbol Fe is enlarged and moved outside of the table to identify important information for you. Iron has an atomic number of 26, which tells you in a stable atom of iron there are 26 protons and electrons. Elements have set characteristics. For example, iron is a solid at room temperature. If you begin heating pure iron, it will melt, changing from a solid to a liquid at 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. So if a blacksmith gets his forge above that temperature, his rod stock of iron will melt into a liquid. You cannot shape a liquid with a hammer and anvil. By heating the rod close to 2800 degrees Fahrenheit, it does not reach that liquid phase, but the metal becomes less solid and more malleable. How does a blacksmith know temperature? They gauge temperature by the color of their heated rodstock. White hot rodstock is close to melting, and red hot rodstock can be shaped. Within a heated rodstock, three processes are always occurring conduction, convection, and radiation. The first is conduction, where individual metal molecules are passing heat energy to each other. The further along the rod stock, the less heat is being passed. If all of the heat were transferred by conduction, the blacksmith could not hold the end of the rod stock without it burning his gloves. So where does the rest of the heat go? Surrounding the heated rod is air. Some of the heat is passed to the molecules or compounds in the air. Everyone has probably felt the heated air from a campfire. The third process occurring in heated metal is radiation. Radiation is the conversion of heat to light. So the color of the light that you are seeing is directly related to the temperature of the metal. At low temperatures, mostly red light is released. At high temperatures, all of the spectra of visible light is radiated and we see it as white light. If a blacksmith wants to weld two pieces together, he must get both pieces white hot to allow them to melt together. The electromagnetic spectrum includes both visible and invisible light waves. Some of the heat in the rod stock is given off as ultraviolet light. These waves could hurt the blacksmith eyes, so they wear glasses to block these waves from getting in their eyes. Ultraviolet light waves are what causes you to get a sunburn. 
So let's look at what happens once the rodstock is heated and the blacksmith starts forging the metal. In this next clip, we see the blacksmith shaping the rodstock into a leaf. As he bends and hammers the metal, a black crust forms on the heated rod. This crust falls off the rod onto the anvil and floor. The blacksmith calls this material scale. So what is scale and how does it form? Scale formation is a chemical reaction, and chemical reactions have three requirements in order to occur. Energy, contact, and orientation. We have already talked about energy and heat, but why is it required? It all goes back to the structure of an atom. Do you remember what particle orbits the nucleus of an atom? Electrons. Electrons have a negative charge, so any time two or more atoms come together, the first part of the atom to interact are their electrons. Since all electrons are negatively charged, they repel each other. Chemical reactions require energy to begin so that their electrons can be forced together. The second requirement is contact. Chemical reactions require two or more atoms to make contact. If they do not touch, there is no reaction. And the third requirement of a chemical reaction is orientation. Simple atoms or molecules have simple shapes. As molecules are made up of more atoms or compounds, they have more complex shapes. These complex shapes reduce the places on the compound that chemically react. So even if the complex compounds make contact with enough energy to push their electrons into each other, they may not have the correct orientation that will allow a chemical reaction to take place. So back to the scale as an example of a chemical reaction. Scale forms on the outside of the rod, and the heat in the rod is driving the reaction. Can you guess what is reacting with the iron? Air is reacting to the iron, or more specifically, the oxygen in the air, forming rust. Oxygen bonds to the heated iron on the surface of the rod, forming iron oxide. Rust usually forms slowly, but because there is so much energy in the heated rod, this reaction happens much faster. As the scale forms on the surface and falls away as the blacksmith bends and forms the rod, new rust occurs almost immediately.